Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod. I'm Sean Furry with Dave Vellante here, episode 75. Dave, salute. John, <laughs> great to see you. Wow, where are you? I'm at the New York Stock Exchange, the Cube East. It's our access point. It's our point of presence. It's our super pop, our super studio on the East Coast. Again, um, as you know, and we've been talking about, we are opening up access, our access point to the Cube Network, expanding our subnet here in New York, of which we have a huge fan base um, from our big data days in Hadoop, which is, you know, we had activated such a great audience here and the tech scene is exploding. And, you know, the, the, the merging of the capital markets with NYSE's network that Brian Bauman has been putting together, the digital wired community, they call it, combined with the Cube, kind of bringing our networks together kind of an informal way has been quite an exceptional explosion of value creation through meeting people, through content creation. And uh, as the world spins to gen of AI, you know, uh, the open source uh, idea of content, really having that platform leverage allows our services from a content standpoint to be more acute, better service to our sponsorships. Um, but just overall, I'm doing over, I think 18 editorial interviews featuring leaders in New York here. You can see the cube logos on the big board behind us. CNBC sets down there below. Uh, we're the second largest footprint on the independent operator on the show floor with the other set we're going to have here, the two sets. Again, just the beginning. You're in Boston with the Cube. We got the Silicon Valley, Boston, New York City, uh, Washington, D.C. will be next. Uh, we'll just continue to add these regional infrastructure nodes, if we call them, because it's really about the people, Dave. As you know, I mean, New York's booming. I just had talked to a great founder out of Brooklyn, uh, Active Fence. His, his mission is so awesome. He's using generative AI to create content firewalls. We had uh, an amazing practitioner building a strategy consultancy around de-risking AI. We had um, a great entrepreneur out of that Stanford Business School, essentially from the capital markets. He was a senior associate at a large private equity late stage. He's democratizing access to financial instruments and financial services via software without being a bank. You're seeing... Um, these processes in these industries that we talked about during the Hadoop days, remember big data, we said, you know, a small feature could be uh, a company with scale and, and differentiation. So a small startup could beat the incumbents. And again, the trend that we're seeing, we've been talking on the last glass cube bottom up through the cube is that SaaS is evolving to full-blown agentic systems. And then, you know, it's climate week. So we're seeing that scalable apps are narrative around new category of applications. Uh, develop. I had four interviews here on climate. One, two of them were basically instrument in the earth, grid by grid to understand all aspects of the atmosphere. One was in space with data in space, looking at atmospheric weather patterns, using predictive analytics and generative AI together. They're not mutually exclusive. Predictive analytics are still hot, but predictive analytics isn't generative AI. So just a tsunami of, of new information coming out of our New York access point here at the New York Stock Exchange. The community is robust, it's active, they're experts, and they love to contribute to um, our model, and which is great news for us and the community. So, um, like I said, look at the big board behind us. We got the Cube Silicon Angle logo. Um, you know, just a great addition to our, our content formula. And Silicon Valley, we got the team up there, you get your team your studio. So, yeah, I hope to do more pods here. I love it, John. Looks great. You look good. I love the logos in the background. And to me, the most interesting thing is you said, what'd you say? You did 18 interviews in two days. Um, and it's, it's just our, our collaboration with the no, NYSE. Three, three days. Three, three days. I'm on the third day right so now. It's, it's like what we did in Palo Alto in August, where we had the Q plus NYSE wired with AI innovators. Uh, what you're doing here with the theme of climate uh, and other tech, you know, tech for climate. Um, I'm hoping to get down there shortly for the CIO event that I'll I'll host, and then just we're gonna yeah. just keep ramping up. I mean, it's super exciting. So great job! I really appreciate you serving. Well, the what's audience. interesting? What's what, what's interesting is is that one, the location is great, right? Out of the NYSE footprint, you know, having a studio option is great. Again, we're digital podcast format, so you know, unlike uh, others trying to be CNBC, we love CNBC. You and I talk about them all the time. We love John Ford. I watch these guys do their thing. They're pros, love their content. Um, but we kind of bolt on next to CNBC in the deeper dives. And uh, just a lot of complimentary uh, motions with CNBC 
mainly because they're on top of the news too. And they're doing video and their production is awesome, right? They have a well-oiled machine on the floor. Um, their content commentary is on point. They serve the general horizontally scalable broad reach audience. I mean, they're a reach vehicle from their content. They're on cable. They got great distribution. Uh, ours is more depth. Our distribution is network effects. So when people ask, like, yeah, no, we're, we're podcast format. Uh, even though with a cube, it's basically podcast style. That's how people understand the cube outside of our event coverage, which is like more game day, you know, um, Thursday night football kind of vibe. So event coverage will continue with the cube. You're going to see a lot more studio conversations um, on the cube in Palo Alto and in New York City and out of Boston. Because, as you know, Dave, digital is great for us because it's a power law just like the AI power law. you got news you can talk about. Of course, we talk about news and analyze that. But there's a long tail of deep content that, we get, that we're doing, journey mapping, talk about a CEO's journey, the origination story, customer stories. Again, customer stories here during Climate Week was phenomenal. And there's a theme every other week here in New York. Practice. Private Equity Week, I think, next week. Oracle's going to be ringing the opening bell, having a big meeting here as you're going to be there for that. You get with Safra Katz, she'll be on CNBC. Hopefully you can just swing by the Cube set as well. So again, it's a target rich environment in New York uh, for high concentrated capital markets, finance, our money, Wall Street meets tech. I love it. I mean, it's exciting. Uh, like Silicon Valley, it's got the vibe. Uh, Silicon Valley, the vibe is just as strong, but it's a little bit more chill. It's the Valley, right? So you got San Francisco and the Bay Area, uh, just deep technology content there. So just... And it's all VCs there too. So you got the money, you got the, the business, but just on different coasts. It's just really good to bring it together. Well, it's funny you say that about the, the Gen AI power law. And, and I'm actually working on the breaking analysis. We're recording this a little bit earlier than we normally do. And I, the reason I bring that up is because the, the premise in the, in, the, in the power law, amongst others, was the torso, instead of being a hard right angle, was going to get pulled up um, to, to the up and to the right with open source and third party models. And for the first time ever, we're going to be you know, releasing this on breaking analysis uh, this week. We'll drop it uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Meta Llama has overtaken Microsoft and OpenAI for the number one spot in terms of spending momentum in the ETR data. I got permission to release <laughs> this. It's preliminary data, but I got permission to, to, to drip it out. Uh, prior to the survey closing, that is huge. I mean, even if they're on par, this is, yeah. this just underscores your point that you've made many times. Open source ultimately is a force Wins. that is unstoppable. And and now that Llama is, is the most spending momentum in customer accounts is, is actually interesting. And I call it spending momentum. It's really adoption because you're spending your time. You know, Llama is yeah. open source, so it's free, but there's a lot of effort in terms of staffing and skills and other infrastructure that goes into that. So that, that is spending, but the momentum for Llama is now number one. So that is huge news in my view and, and exactly what we said was gonna happen with the power law and, and Anthropic is right there too as one of those third parties pulling up that torso, John. So, and you of course got open yeah. AI news and I'm sure you're gonna talk about that. You know, the, continue, the company yeah. continues to transition. I mean, look, at, I mean, the fact of the matter is that our conversation over the past couple of weeks, and our last pod, if people are listening, go listen to our last podcast, episode 74, um, we laid out um, our first kind of dot connecting around what will emerge as top of the stack for this next generation generative AI, because it's there's an old and new way, but the old way isn't going away. Like predictive analytics is different than generative, but they're not, they're staying around, but generative AI is going to grow faster. So listen to that narrative because there's the SaaS market, okay? The, the, the cloud wave was an innovation on the back end. There was no real front end innovation. No one really cared that they got their food delivered faster. They just, again, that SaaS was the power behind it. Just the cloud made that happen. So with generative AI, it's a front end innovation and the back end. So you've got to do both to be successful. And many people are, are learning that SaaS is not a business model. It's a, it's a, it's a mechanism to deliver the back-end value of, say, cloud or distributed computing. With generative AI, the, 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 the software now is a business tool, not so much the business itself. So you're seeing a lot of people building companies that are features, not companies. So you've got to be careful on who's actually got a business model out of open source and who is actually going to just create a business tool or business function, business enabler 
Um, and then the business model will be enhanced and accelerated by generative AI. And I think that's where open source will go, as well as um, um, other examples here on, our, our, on the new business model of scalable apps. Like I said, um, this stuff being done in climate change that has never been possible before without large scale, hyper high performance computing like systems, like supercomputers for the masses, like NVIDIA and these clustered systems. So that's a backend innovation, enabling new applications and problems by engineers and entrepreneurs that can be solved for the first time in history. Again, stuff that was elusive, ungettable, is now possible. And that is a new category of applications and platforms that I believe will, will hit the scene really hard, needle moving, game changing, ball moving down the field, whatever you want to say, it's going to happen. And the satisfaction wave will be agentic based, which becomes potentially new business models, but not the software itself is the business model. So what Meta is doing is significant in the data because they're showing that their adoption has surpassed open AI, which I think is trying to raise billions of dollars in working capital. Uh, they're spending a lot. So they're run the risk of CapExing out, if, if you will. So they got to potentially watch that, keep spending more, it's an arms race there. So what enabling, what's coming out of Llama is the enablement, Dave, to create new business models. The other thing that's coming out of the, um, this week in New York is that computer vision is underestimated. Everyone's talking about search as the killer app. I interviewed the CEO of Glean. They're killing it. Search is everywhere now. He comes from Google. He worked at uh, Palo Alto, not Palo Alto, it was a Riverbed, Rubric, early employee there. Now he's got a new company. They're doing great. They're search. I talked to another startup that's, that's creating open source tooling around computer vision. They are the number one libraries for using computer vision in open source. Computer vision and visualization, visual data is the killer app for generative AI. It's multimodal. Oh. Nobody's talking about computer vision, Dave. Oh, wow. uh, and and okay. it's amazing. I'm glad you brought that up. So two things, just want a point of clarification. So we're not saying that, that um, Llama adoption is higher than open AI. Um, it, it, it may be, I don't, think it is, but it's the momentum of the adoption, the pace of adoption, the spending velocity on that um, platform has surpassed, you know, barely, but still surpassed. So I just want to make that clarification. I think OpenAI is still much more you know, deeply penetrated. Um, this, the, the second well, thing- Well, I, I mean, think, I, mean the, I mean, the data, I, I appreciate the clarification. I mean, gen, more broadly, I'm just thinking just the trend in general about open source points to that. Yeah. yeah, we'll parse through, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just, I just, I, you know, I like to be, <laughs> you know me, I like to be precise <laughs> when it comes to data. But then this, the, the second thing on computer vision, it's interesting you say that because I think about, you know, when RPA was the hot thing going, UiPath was on fire. Uh, obviously, they have been, um, you know, pivoting the company and go, uh, going hard after Agentic. Uh, but computer vision is their secret sauce. So it's interesting that you say that because what's happened, and when I look at the data, what's happened is that, LLMs and Gen AI have clearly had an impact on the traditional RPA players like UiPath. Of course, they don't even consider themselves an RPA player anymore. They're much more than that, sort of um, around hyper automation and automation. Nonetheless, what happened was very clearly, and you saw this in SaaS as well, people who are adopting Gen AI are saying, well, maybe we can kind of replace a lot of our existing software. So RPA, traditional RPA vendors definitely took a hit. What you're seeing in the data now is people are realizing that the ROI ain't so easy. You can't just, you know, spin up some clusters and do some API calls to open AI. You know, it's much more complicated than that if you want to actually get ROI. And so what we're seeing now is some of those plumbing companies that have things like computer vision or have established that plumbing through things like our RPA, i.e. the connectors to and the integration with other application platforms are actually coming back a little bit. And maybe this means that AI generally and, and Gen AI specifically and LLMs are potentially a tailwind for these guys. And I think they will be to the extent that they can ride the agentic wave moving beyond LLMs to both small language models, but not just small, secure, sovereign, safe, et cetera. And not just have one agent, but multi-agent uh, orchestration that with a harmonized layer that we talk about all the time. There's real ripe uh, uh, ground to farm there. And it's interesting you bring up computer vision because that is a key piece of IP that certain companies like UiPath possess. 
while well, UiPath was a pioneer in RPA, I think RPA set the table for um, what is now generative AI. We always talk about that. Remember, we always say, we should use RPA to automate the cube process. Right. You aren't wrong. But, we're like, <laughs> but it was like, okay, the work required to set up those workflows was tedious. Now the world is moving to Gen AI and companies like UiPath and others will be um, prepared for it. And all the success we're seeing is people adjusting their business model. So leaders, people who own businesses and or are running things are actually spending the quality time looking at, okay, how do they adjust their sails of their boat to catch the wind that's a tailwind. In some cases, companies have to actually move and turn the headwind into a tailwind. So in navigating a boat, that you that means get behind the wind, throw the sails up, change the sails. And so the companies that are in position to take advantage of a gen of AI will get incremental massive step function gains in their business model, or new business models will emerge like uh, Active Fence I interviewed, like RoboFlow, which is doing the computer vision, talk to that founder. You're seeing people who are in business doing certain things that are compatible with the tactics and strategies and metrics around where Gen AI will do well. And they make small minor adjustments to their focus, bring in generative AI capabilities, and then boom, it's, a, it's a escape velocity. So especially in professional services business, Dave, you're seeing you know, a big theme here is that what was not a big platform backed VC company doing a dual model approach by taking professional services and adding operating leverage in the platform that makes their service better so they can scale up the people side of it one-to-one, -one, but get a step function platform leverage advantage that is not a lot of investment. So it doesn't take a lot of capital to do that. It just takes management focus and, and intellectual thinking, cognition to saying, oh, let's use generative AI to do this, this, and that, that gives us some advantages to our service so if you're like a consulting firm, you're providing white club service, that dual function relationship is key to the modern era right now. And we're seeing the most successful companies doing well by building the platform with Gen AI built in, with all the things built in from day one around the service, not the other way around, which is professional service. And then you build the platform, scale that. It, they're, they're, it's a flywheel, the dual component flywheel. And again, this is new information. Um, and companies like Accenture used to scale up by adding more bodies. So that model still exists, but now you just add platform leverage, you get lower costs, you get higher margins, better service. That's interesting. I find that fascinating. The, the, reason, why this, the reason why this resonates with me, John, and it is interesting is because first of all, I love services. Second of all, to the extent that services can get you know, better marginal economics through automation, uh, there's a lot of really great businesses out there that can thrive. I think the third thing yeah. is that we're finding a, a couple of data points is, is in the in the April surveys uh, that we work on with ETR, about 42 percent of customers said that their Gen AI initiatives were being funded by stealing from other budgets. In the latest survey of 1600 IT decision makers, that number is up to 45 percent. And the interesting thing here is that. Uh, a lot of those initiatives are being funded out of business lines, business applications, non-IT departments, mm -hmm. outsourced services, marketing departments. And the reason I bring that up is because they've got a big stake in uh, aligning with the, the tech and the business, number one. Number two is the second thing in the data that's really interesting is the ROI expectations are getting pushed out. The percentage of customers that are saying ROI is now going to take more than a year is higher than it's ever been. So the takeaway is Gen AI is still being funded by stealing from other budgets, so it's not just open the checkbooks, and you know the macro shows us that. IT spending is growing at maybe 3.5% this year with the latest GDP numbers at 3%. And the second thing is, the, it's harder than people thought. The ROI expectations are getting pushed out. What does that have to do with what you, what you were just talking about? Well, services is how you're ultimately going to receive that ROI to close gaps in skills and lower risk and improve time to market. And to the extent that those services can be highly automated, that's good news because things will happen faster with higher quality and the economics of that, those businesses will improve quite dramatically. So I, I, I love that angle, John. Yeah, it's awesome. And I think I think one of the things that's again, I love I just I love looking at the Q pod screen and seeing our logo in the background. Um, you know, what's interesting again coming out of our new access point here and our footprint uh, in New York, just, just for the folks listening to the cube, 
pod, you know, we view this as infrastructure to us because this is people who live here and they distribute and do network effect, Dave. So, you, you know, we want to share that. But we're going to do a lot of content in New York. We're going to do a lot of activations around our editorial programming, tell the stories that are really important. No, to no stories too small. We want to get more expert content into our neural net. Uh, I talked with yesterday, we had um, um, Bernie came on from JetCool, founder and CEO. He was phenomenal. He actually came on Wednesday. Um, Arvind Jain was here, CEO of Green. I mentioned that. Dr. Ami from uh, Open Policy, co-founder and CEO, changing the policy game by making things more transparent and open. Um, we had the founder and CEO of Knock App, which is Sam Seeley, their um, venture-backed company, um, doing all kinds of great observability data. Noam Schwartz was the guy I mentioned who's doing active fence. He's got such a great mission. He started the company on, on a vision, a mission. It's a very cool story. Uh, we had Jonathan from Voxable, okay? Um, he's that CFO. We had CFOs on Carbon Carbon Arc. This is a company, Dave, you got to watch. Kirk uh, McEwen from uh, Carbon Arc. Um, interesting arbitrage opportunity, the way he's using data. So, you know, you're seeing people using data differently. Um, we, and again, we had uh, so many other great guests. We had a lot of cybersecurity. We had Huntress came on. They're, they're doing 100 million in our, uh, ARR. Tomorrow.io, um, Adam Networks. <laughs> they, had, they had a great business model opportunity. We'll see how that goes. Lock them down, the, creating a perimeter. They're bringing the perimeter back, Adam Networks is. Um, and then obviously we just you know, had great events today. We had IBM on, Trusted AI, um, Arc, Arc, this company called Arc, Don Muir, he got this technology, like I said, for capital markets and private equity. But yeah, I mean, pretty did, much a uh, great, great week here. Did, uh, did you uh, interview in Arvind? York. Did you interview Arvind from Glean? Yes, Arvind, the CEO. Yes. Yeah, I'm stoked to see that. He's awesome. So, you know, he's pedigree. He's got uh, early days, Google 2003. Um, yeah. He started there, was on the core search team. So he knows a little bit about search. Again, enterprise search is a little different animal. It's got more you know, privilege access management challenges. Um, but he went to Palo, not Palo, the next Riverbed as the third employee, first non-founder hire. Uh, so he wrote that IPO. Uh, he basically had multiple eggs at Google. Donatelli's new company. Google. Donatelli's the CEO there now. <laughs> and then he went to Rubrik rode the rubric wave with Bitbull. Well, they're an NYSE listed company. Um, and then he started Glean and he saw the LLMs. He saw the op what OpenAI was doing early on. Um, he's super excited. So I want to thank uh, the Glean team, Rena and the folks over there. Tomorrow, I already interviewed the head of product. It's a great story. Really, really strong story. They take enterprise search, a, an area that's hard to crack the code on and brought in generative AI technology and built basically a horizontal control plane data. They're trying to be the um, semantic layer control plane between all data movement and management and search, finding what you're looking for is really key. And that means data machine to machine, also machines to humans uh, as well. So Glean is a hot company. And again, their story, they rose to escape velocity in a New York minute, you know, pun intended. Remember, they were struggling, you know, and then this is what happens. You got to keep that curve going and then boom, you go vertical. That's what's happening in this Gen AI market. So at any given time, a company hits it, they go exponential and they go escape velocity. That's where the growth kicks in. Glean went through that. So they had the North Star, but you got to have, just got to be the timing. You got to get out there into the arena and then shoot it up. Uh, had a great breakfast this morning with a CEO uh, who's doing, um, came out of Stanford, him and his PhD buddy started a company founded by Andreessen Horowitz. So again, New York is buzzing, Dave, okay? And here's my test. When I'm in New York and I hear people talking about serverless on the, free, on the sidewalk, walking past me, I go, whoa, <laughs> you don't, that wasn't like that before. It used to be in New York. Hey, what do you do? I'm in tech. Oh, okay, next. Hey, how about those Yankees? You know, they don't really, they didn't really know the tech beast <laughs> in New York, unless you were in finance. Here in New York, it is completely transformed. I don't know if it was the pandemic, it was the web 2.0 generation that flipped it over, but clearly New York has major activity in entrepreneurship um, and they're getting, their, they're getting their muscle, right? Silicon Valley, certainly generations and generations ahead of New York, but you, you can replicate the capital markets here. They have them. You got the entrepreneurial energy, you got the support systems. Uh, New York is, is rocking and 
it's, <laughs> you know me, I love to swim in the entrepreneurial waters. It's, it's the arena here is phenomenal. I find it very ironic that you from Silicon Valley are in New York interviewing all these startups. I love it. But you know what? Silicon Valley meets money. That's where it's all, where it's all happening here. The money <laughs> my business. inner Jersey's coming out, Dave. I love it here. You know, growing yeah. up in the wind and all my life in New Jersey and spending all my summers in Massachusetts. Yeah, I'm East Coast. So, you know, one of the things I didn't like about the East Coast and why I moved to California just 25 years ago was, you know, to do do startups, you got to be in California. It's access to all the capital and the knowledge workers there. Um, and it was truly heaven. And it still is, but it's changing. The demographics are changing in Silicon Valley uh, as well, certainly in Palo Alto, the town that my all my four kids went to school in and we spent 25 years in uh, is changing with demographics. Housing prices are out of control. New York's no spring you know, it's a picnic here either, right? So on housing, but you're starting to see that movement. So I got to tell you, as someone who loves entrepreneurship and startups and bit and technology, this is hot. So it wasn't like that a decade ago. I mean, no. sort of yeah, big data, fintech. They all were doing all the hedge funds, all the banks. Yeah, it was all certainly bond technology. Talk back then. <laughs> no, they had technology, but it I'm wasn't kidding. cultural. It wasn't cultural, Dave. And that's what I'm saying. When you're walking down the street and you're on on Bowery next to Chinatown or Little Italy here in New York, and you hear people talking about technology a lot all around you, you know, randomly, then it's it's pervasive. Well, the Bowery right? so, is up and coming. I mean, it's where all the young people go now. When I was a kid, it was yeah. like the, the worst part of the city. But a lot of news this week, John. Open AI actually going, turning into a nonprofit. Justice Department investigating Supermicro. Google is hitting... You know, Microsoft with antitrust, how ironic is that? I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, the open AI drama is really interesting. You know, um, the, the fact that uh, Mira quit, she's the CTO, is a string of latest executive department departures, right? So, you know, the company's restructuring back for a for-profit, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you were critical. We were both critical. You yeah, were totally. pounding your hand on the table. The worst thing I've ever seen. And you weren't wrong, right? So, um, you know, and, and, you know, larger models are improving. You mentioned the open source piece. You know, I mean, bring yeah. back Google. Google's trying to bring back talent, paying tons of people. Did you see the Wall Street Journal article? Yeah, the Journal had a really Google's good article on the timeline of open AI departures. Um, you know, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, let, let's face it, they started this whole thing off, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lesson in how not to launch a company as a nonprofit and then try to go to a for-profit. It's just, it's just not a great formula. The flip side is doable if you have a for-profit company and you can invest in a nonprofit arm. I mean, I think that's as we were saying before. That's that's imminently viable. But there's there's a brain drain there, and you you wonder. You know, I I go back to where you Sarbjeet and I did a breaking analysis in January of 2023, saying that the, the, our premise was Sarbjeet and I that OpenAI wouldn't be able to maintain its first mover advantage, and your premise was. Yeah, it will. It'll keep innovating. We, the, the jury's still out on that. Um, but but be really curious to see what kind of competition they get, how fast they can move, you know, whether these open source models can challenge them. Uh, but this, it feels a little dysfunctional. And then kind of Sam Altman at the tops looks like he's going to get his payday of, you know, 10 plus billion. The company's, what now, $150 billion valuation with a $6 billion raise? Okay, yeah. you know they're off and running, but and, they're going to need and, more and, capital. And, Dave, and, and, and Anthropic is reportedly in early talks to raise funding at a forty billion dollar valuation. Um, so you know, Amazon's going to have a good stake in that one. I mean, they're giving equity yeah. around, so just they're going to they get I mean, they're going to have to get their pro rata. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they don't want pony up. You know, they own pony up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get more money to pay the hyperscalers. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, look at the, the fact of the matter is, is you're starting to see the little guys form up in the startup community. You know, we always said we worried about the big whales, the rich getting richer. But, you know, you're starting to see, um, you know, about 20 to 40 million dollar series A's around agents, enterprise agents. Uh, Nurex AI just raised 27 and a half. Um, Deep Opinion raised uh, 11 million euros to assist in uh, enterprise business with uh, for AI agents. Again. The software is not the business model. 
the business model is business model, not the tool. So I think, you know, I'm building a SaaS app or um, building uh, this capability. The open, the open AI movement two years ago that started this shows that you have to do the work in both theaters. George Gilbert and I talked about this extensively at Salesforce's Dreamforce. Both the back end and the front end work has to get done. You can't just adopt a tech stack and have no process. You have the culture and process and the tech stack and the IT. So IT can say, oh, we've got the new modern stack, but if you don't change any of the process, you're done. So the user experience, user interface, user delight has to be addressed with the process for the new technology in the back end. So again, it's the first time in my career I've ever seen this happen on both of those theaters of innovation. And it's, you know, it's either been one or the other, one front end or back end. Cloud was back end. I'd argue that SaaS was not an innovation. It was just a mechanism of making stuff go faster and cheaper to the, to the, to the customer. Now with Gen of AI, it's a significant step function different change. So you know, I think that's the relevant thing. And again, it's hard to do both. And I think that's where people will fail in startups, not doing the work on both sides or not having a solution, whether a managed service relationship. So I think it's going to be a biz dev uh, and market, Dave, I think you see a lot of partnerships form. And that's why I like the New York City hub for us and Silicon Valley and Boston, because we now have access points to our network uh, in all the markets. So that people can do biz dev, they can build collaborative relationships. I mean, you could get a managed service to take care of all the heavy lifting on say notifications. That's the knock app, the founders there are awesome. They work at Slack, they slog through the notification hell. It's a front end problem but backend engineers end up solving it. So they're like, hey, we just do it as a managed service. And they know everything about notifications, preferences, scaling them. And it's just a really kind of, a, sounds like a small market, but it's huge. Well, that's, that's what's going on. What else do we got? What do you make of the Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, uh, Google suing Microsoft or hitting Microsoft with antitrust? I found it very ironic that basically, <laughs> Hey, Google, who's kind of number well, three. It was an E, it was an E, it was a, it's a, this is a policy pissing contest, basically. Google filed, it's an EU antitrust complaint, by the way, not, I don't think it was in the US. Um, no, it's correct. I'm, it's correct. I'm more, it was, it was EU, but it was initiated by Google. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Google case, filed a complaint Microsoft. against Microsoft with the European Union's top antitrust regulars escalating a long running dispute over the cloud computing business and the complaint the search giant accuses Microsoft of abusing its market power in enterprise software to push businesses to use its Azure cloud platform and keep them locked in there. I just find it very ironic that Google's talking about locking people in. I mean, so when, you know, when they're getting accused of doing the same. But yeah, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more interested in the super micro um, report by the Justice Department's probing them on suspicions of activity. Shares dropped like a rock. I mean, their stock has fallen huge from highs. I mean, so you know what's I, interesting I, about I mean, that's that? The, that's the buzz here, and that's the buzz here behind me down well, on the floor, is, well, is the well, stock price of Supermicro. What's interesting about that, it, my understanding is it was a whistleblower who was in the services department at Supermicro, and my reading of it is Supermicro was moving super fast, pushing out boxes, and you know maybe they, a little bit, they were pushing the envelope a little bit before prime time, so the services division was getting inundated probably with with service requests and so evidently that's the individual who blew the whistle on all this saying they were shipping stuff and recognizing revenue before the time etc 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 i don't know i mean look and, and the pace of things moving so fast and being competitive i have no idea if they broke the law i mean i understand if they're pushing the envelope but it was just interesting yeah. to me john that it was it, it this emanated if i understand it correctly emanated from the service side of the business, which was probably getting swamped with, with requests uh, for fixes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just insane. You know, there's so much activity. And again, another data point to look at, I want to get your thoughts on is that Smartsheet went private at $8.4 billion deal. Um, you saw that um, that happen. Again, I, I saw, congratulations to, to Madrona, got a good exit there. Oct Octa, Octal M AI, which is Octa ML, Luis says his company, he's a Cube alumni, sold to NVIDIA. Okay, so that's a really interesting deal. So that they would do an inference there. He's a great uh, computer science professor at the University of Washington. 
in Seattle. I've known him for years, been a big Cube fan. He's been on many times. Um, they sold NVIDIA, so an AccuHire, basically for like 100, almost 200 million. Um, not a huge number, not a bad number, um, but just goes to show you that, you know, a lot of these inference vendors can't make it on their own. So gotta, you got to have all the right stuff. So again, great technology feature could get it to the, be the company, but what a great team. That was interesting news. So Madrona made money this week on both deals. Madrona Ventures um, out of Seattle. Um, so that's it. Salesforce bought a company out of Israel. Zoom in, feed data to agents. Um, yeah, that's the old seeing, Zoom info business, right? I think that's a great acquisition. That's like, that's like, that's like Microsoft buying LinkedIn, right? I mean, more data. No, no, for, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom in. Okay. So isn't, not, isn't, not Zoom info. Okay, I got confused then. I thought they changed their yeah. name or something. What's Zoom in do? Zoom in is a data pipeline. It's what they do is essentially um, they do um, they process unstructured data that feed agents. Oh so my Zoom god, Info that's even more like, interesting. <laughs> I mean, basically, it's a content delivery platform that basically takes unstructured data and makes it more accessible. It feeds the AI. It's like a feeder. Um, Dell's been a customer. Uh, MasterCard, they had some good tools. We've got to write about Silicon Angle on this one. Um, again, Salesforce, very inquisitive. And you're going to start to see them stitch together their agent platform uh, for this agent force platform, they, they're calling it. Um, yeah, I think they're going to be building. The question is, Salesforce has to make it all work, right? At the end of the day, um, you got to get it done. Now, Zoom in raised 70 million, okay? Uh, and they, the deal was valued around, uh, roughly 450 million. Okay, so not a 10x. Okay, more than 5x on the raise. So yeah, good outcome for them. And uh, we're, I think you're going to see a very weird market. A lot of M and A, a lot of Accu hires, and a lot of face plants from startups. And again, the face plant will come into no product market fit or mis misreading the um, the market where you're not valuable, i.e., you know, not doing the back end and front end or having an answer for those, in my opinion. So it's just a lot of good action, Dave. I mean, just yeah, continuing Silicon Angle, continue to pump out, pump out more of the in. stories. I'm reading the article by Mike Wheatley on Silicon Angle now. I obviously was clueless on this, I apologize. But yeah, this is interesting. They're kind of they're positioning it as sort of, you know, agent integration. Um, you know, they got the content delivery platform. They, they were an early investor. Salesforce Ventures had invested in these guys. And it's just, you know, propping up agent force. Very interesting here. I mean, Salesforce going for it. Look, what they announced with agent force is very immature. I think it was largely single agent, but their vision is multi-agent. And they're, they've got the harmonization layer. They've got the data cloud. Um, and they've got the, the, the leadership and the integration with all their other applications, all that business logic, all the application data that lives inside there. So really interesting. Okay, zoom in, Israeli-based company. Looks like a nice little tuck-in acquisition, John. Yeah, it's, it's good, it's good for them, absolutely. Um, the, uh, another, another interesting thing that's going on is, is that um, you're starting to see a lot more digital expansion um, around companies that are doing Things expand their reach. They're already in the market. They're the right form. We're seeing that done, and then just the AI code and DevOps piece is, gonna, I think, going to be a very big part. We're interested to see what happens at KubeCon this year around cloud native and cloud native services. So we'll have again, we'll be at KubeCon again, North America in Salt Lake City. Um, if you're listening to this and you are attending, let us know. We have editorial and sponsorship opportunities. But cloud native, that Kubernetes microservices workload area has to get better faster because the pressure for foundational reliable services and, and I hate to use the word quote data protection is huge now, Dave. But every conversation is about, I need platform to make sure that the data is not hacked, the threat vectors are increased. So if you don't have the cloud native infrastructure on distributed computing with cloud on-prem and edge nailed down, you're not going to be set up for success. And so there's a lot of pressure on that big time. And you know, that's it's keeping feeding more. It's feed, it feeds more of the chip business, obviously, because the foundation it starts from chips. Um, and yeah, you know, again, Broadcom does well there. 
NVIDIA does well there, AMD does well there, and Intel was from might try to get a position there. Um, speaking of Broadcom, by the way, BJ sent me a note. Um, they're developing a deal with Charter Communications and Comcast for new chips to, to are delivering cable internet. So cable internet, we all kind of experiences with <laughs> from home usage. We all want faster. But guess what? Broadcom's doing its job. Thank you very much, Broadcom. Go, go faster, please. I, I, both shipping the chips and getting in more internet. Well, the semiconductor market got a boost this week because everybody was, you know, concerned about Micron. They were concerned about competition from the likes of SK Hynix, Hynix and others, and they weren't sure about AI demand. Well, bro, well, well uh, uh, Micron blew away its estimates, it said demand for HBM, high bandwidth memory, off the charts, uh, and, and, and everything just exploded uh, the other day on that news. I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I think it's right in front of us. These hyperscalers are investing like crazy. NVIDIA is going crazy. Everybody's like, well, they're going to have all this competition, NVIDIA. Okay, well, they can't keep margins up. I'm like, mm, yeah, they can actually if they're first, and I think they will be. So. The, the AI, you know, picks and shovels boom continues thanks to the hyperscalers. And it's all, by the way, funded with balance sheet cash, not debt, which I love. Um, not that these companies don't have debt, but it's not like Global Crossing and Enron. And so Micron set the world on fire and it was a very strong indicator. And every, everything else is up, well, was up the other day on sympathy. Uh, and then the China news, you know, China getting really aggressive about you know injecting some liquidity into their markets so now the all the chinese stocks which are undervalued in theory are up you know rocketing away alibaba and tencent and baidu and the indices uh, they've been they've been really down there like double digit growth with single digit pe's it's like some investors are like hmm i think i'm going to take a chance now you know when china invades taiwan i don't know what's going to happen there so you're you are rolling the dice but you know, relatively speaking, especially in terms of you took look at a company like Alibaba, where it was back during the pandemic, um, it's way, way down from its from its highs. So so China could give a big lift to all these other economies, not only China itself, which wants to grow at five percent, but but the rest of Asia and Europe and potentially even the United States. It's going to be interesting to see if if the global economy gets picked up and has a big tailwind you know what, maybe interest rates won't come down as fast as everybody thinks, but uh, that's something to be really interesting to watch, John. Yeah, and uh, you know, just some other cool things happening. Uh, actually, I have to get up to a lunch upstairs, Brian, at the NYSC is doing his Wired series. They do tech talks here, uh, bring in execs. It's the CEO of Credo AI, she's amazing. Um, they got a bunch of people in there, IBM's in there, a bunch of customers, partners. Uh, so after this five, I'm going to jump upstairs with an end. But on, the, on our ending note here, I want to just highlight the fact that Meta had their Connect conference, um, um, Facebook uh, event where they released, and Zuckerberg had the new glasses, the uh, unbelievable announcement. I, I love that stuff. I bought Google Glass when it came out uh, many moons ago. I just love the idea of augmentation to human value. And the, remember the Ray-Ban sunglasses? Yeah. They had that whole thing going Very on. Very wearable. No batteries. Yeah, and, and they're not available yet, but it's just, as he said, what I like what he said, just showing what's possible. And, you know, we're, you know, we have, we come from that same ethos was we develop our AI systems. When it's not so much how complete it is, it's definitely good. It's showing what's possible and why we're doing it. I think what Meta's doing is so smart the, on how they're doing the AI play with open source they're creating more stickiness with their platform, which is a big risk factor anyway. We know that, but they're becoming more stickier and they're bringing in more user experiences that are modern. They're investing a lot. And so I think the glass it has legs. Um, it looks good. I mean, they look kind of like dorky for sure, the big round glass rims. But my friend Chris, Claw, Chris Law worked on that and she was telling me about it at, at Paul Martino's 50th birthday party. I'm like, dude, you're working on the augmented reality project. Cool. There's a lot of tech involved, Dave. This is only going to get better. The question that I ask is, does that screw up your eyes? You know, like, you mean like, uh, <laughs> like the, the movie, remember the movie, the, the jerk, jerk. opti grab, yeah. opti grab, opti grab. And then the guy gets cross-eyed every, all the, yeah, all the customers cross get cross-eyed. It's hilarious. That was a great movie back the throwback to the, whenever eighties, uh, Steve we're Martin. We're dating, our, we're dating ourselves. Absolutely hilarious. He hates cans. He hates cans. <laughs> We are dating ourselves. Um, yeah. 
Well, cool. I got to go get ready for breaking analysis. Um, any yeah. news that we didn't hit that we should have? Um, well, my brain is full. I got a lot of action going on. New here. Llama new models, new Llama models from Meta, you know, supporting them. Yeah. Smart sheet going yeah. private, $8.4 billion deal. Wow. Um, you know, Pat Gelsinger getting, you know, more help from the U.S., but the vultures are circling. There was a rumor, and I think Reuters, Reuters or Bloomberg, that ARM was approached Intel about buying its design, chip design business. So the vultures are circling there. It was uh was the sort of silicon angle headline. Yeah. Um, I mean, the top story here, Dave, is New York is hot, it's rocking, and there's real action here. There's real capital markets, there's real investment. Um, it's it's smaller, faster, cheaper capabilities are happening. And the ability to do a startup is coming so low, okay, that it's really going to be a democratization market. And there's, there's a certain formula that's happening. And then you're starting to see it now. If you can build in data advantages, for real value, not for business model value, means either create a product that's better and lower cost than the competition. Simple to say that, right? Hey, our product's better than the competition and it's lower price. I mean, those are those are competitive strategy things. Or hey, my product's faster than the competition and it's free. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I make money doing something else. <laughs> and just before you go, a couple other things. We were at NetApp this week. Rob Streche was out there, NetApp Insight. You know, Net, I have seen NetApp trans, uh, transform from network appliance, where it was basically, you know, a workstation storage company, uh, and then it, you know, trans, uh, transformed into a company that, you know, virtualization was supposed to kill um, NetApp. Well, they adopted to virtualization, and the cloud was supposed to kill NetApp, but they adopted to the cloud. And now they're really leaning into AI, trying to be an, an AI platform. So I'm interested to watch the coverage there from that event. And then, of course, next week, you got vast data with Cosmos. Yeah. We got any scale, you know, Ray Summit coming up. Um, hot companies. Um, really excited to see the coverage from the cube there, John. Yeah. Well, Dave, I just can't stop staring at the Silicon Angle logo <laughs> over there. <It's, laughs> okay. Great job down there, John. You're working your your ass off and uh, serving the audience. Obviously, you know that's a primary objective of our mission is really we're audience first and we're very client yeah. driven as well. And we, we can't thank our clients yeah. and our sponsors enough for being supporting our model so that we yeah. can serve the audience and, you know, grow that audience as we're doing, uh, you know, in collaboration with folks like the NYSE and um, great job, John. Thank you for, for making yeah. the time. I yeah, know this I, was stressful for you. <laughs> well, thanks to our team. I think our team on SiliconANGLE, the Cube and Cube Research is phenomenal. We all work hard. Uh, and but we have a great team of high professional people who are working hard to move fast to create the better product in the competition, a better product for the for the audience, better service with an operating platform. So you know internally our team, our team has really been cranking away, and we're going to continue to optimize on this. So you know as we spend more time thinking about how to get the sales up and capture the tailwind that is generative AI for the work that we're already doing. Free content is working. Open source to content. It is happening. People here love it. I mean, I'm so excited by the response in New York here because one, we have a pre-existing community here, but they want to engage. And, and then they're engaging now in a market with, even with Gender AI helping, the ability to be a contributor to our mission. It doesn't like open source software. You can still write a line of code and be part of an Apache or a Linux foundation project. Here with the Cube, you can still contribute commentary with our, on our original with our original content like Sarvjeet uses, or be an actual contributor of hardcore data and knowledge and commentary, there's 10 zillion ways to participate in open ways. And I think we are harnessing a new dynamic that'll create better insights, faster for everybody. So, you know, the- High frequency insights, you say, I love that phrase. High yeah. frequency uh, insights. Uh, out here, high frequency trading changed the game and high frequency insights, entrepreneurs are building their products, because real-time value is now going to be, become a very big key thing for us and for these apps. I mean, like at the end of the day, data, data enables that. I mean, we're seeing uses of data we've never seen before from arbitrage to real value creation and user value. So again, across the gamut, Dave, the processes are being looked at. Every single business will have a digital twin in every department. Um, I think digital twins is going to be one of those things where you're going to hear a lot more around how people are taking digital twins concepts and mechanisms to figure out how to make something better, 
like in manufacturing. We all know digital twins in manufacturing is great because you can simulate use cases to make products better, identify breakage, wear and tear, efficiency, make the process better. Well, guess what? If you're not manufacturing, you're marketing or another department, you can still do simulations and look at data to make things better. You have to think digital twins. And you know, soon we'll, we'll be, I think, talking more about it. I think it might get a different name, but right now it's called digital twins. Uh, we are definitely building digital twins for Cube. So event coverage will turn into a digital twin. We'll continue to, to do that. So I just I just love this market right now and, and can't wait to go meet more founders upstairs in the 1792 room. All right, John, we'll enjoy and uh, safe yep. travels. I will uh, see you soon, man. Thank you. All right. Thank you.